We're going to be continuing from last week. We're going to be in John chapter 6. Uh, start out around verse 30, but let's go back and kind of get a little backlog of what just happened. So we understand that Christ had just fed the multitude. He had split the loaves and the fishes and blessed it and divided it up among thousands of people and it fed them. And after it fed them, then they had bunches left over. And after they had all that left over, Christ sent his disciples across the sea. The raves got rough. Everything got real bad. He goes out and he walks on the sea to get to them. Peter's in the boat. He looks up and says, Lord, if it's you, let me come out and come to you. And he stepped over the boat and he got and he walked toward him for a little while. And then bloop, he sank and the Lord picked him up out of the water. And they got back into the boat. He calmed the sea. And he said, why? Why did you lose your faith? Well, Peter had looked at the waves and things around him and forgot who he was dealing with. He was dealing with the Lord who has control over the sea, he has control over the wind and the rain and everything to do with it. A lot of people chastise Peter about that. They say, I can't believe that Peter took his eyes off the Lord and sank. I don't chastise Peter over that. I chastise the rest of the boat if I'm going to chastise anyone because Peter got out of the boat and the rest of the people stayed in the boat unless he had faith to get out and walk to the Lord. But truth be known, I'm not going to chastise anybody because I don't know where I would go. Would you get out of the boat or not? You don't know. You don't know until you're put in that position. Anyways, they went over and they got to the other side. The people looked. They looked around. They seen that the Christ was gone. They seen that the disciples had gone. And they knew that Christ had gone with the disciples. They loaded up their boats. They took across the other side. They got there and they said, where'd you get here? How'd you, how'd you make it across? And immediately after they, they almost started on a spiritual track where Christ said, you know what? I can do all things. I can walk on the water to get over there if I need to. I can just flash and be over there if I need to. I'm the son of God. They almost got on a spiritual track and then they, they left. But it says, and when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, whence camest thou hither? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat the loaves and were filled. He said, I'm displaying myself as the Christ, that I have power over nature. I have power over the physical things that you see right in front of you. I'm showing you that I'm the Lord, and you're not even asking me because you're wondering about who I am. You're asking me because you want some more of that fish and bread. And it says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. And we understand that when it says him hath God the Father sealed, that's the same sealed. If you look all through Revelation, it's the same thing, which is kind of a little handy insight when you go to studying that. But he said, you are looking at physical things. Forget physical for just a minute. Just forget it for a little while. Look at the spiritual things. Look at this thing that will endure for eternity rather than looking at something that is going to endure for 20 hours or 24 hours. They ate yesterday and they're hungry again. He said, that's not going to fill you up. That's not going to fix you. But what will fix you is me and everlasting life. He said, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. And when they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus said unto them, this is the work of God that you believe on him who he hath sent. Believe on me. That's what he says. And it's all going to come to fruition later. It takes a little time. See, they're kind of, they're dropping in the middle of this story just a little bit. And if they had, had read and applied the Old Testament to him, it'd be clear as a bell, but they hadn't. So they're trying to figure out how everything lines up. He said, you're going to have to believe on him who the Father sent. And right now, they, think, they see that and they hear it and they say, believe on you who the Father sent. You're right in front of us. But give it just a little while when he's crucified. And they say, well, he's gotten killed. And then three days later, he rises from the grave. And then they say, that's what he means. Believe on him who, has, who the Father has sent. The law click. The law have the ability to come together. They're just in the middle of the story right now. And it said, And they said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe? And what dost thou work? 
Let us see a sign that you're the Christ. We know that you took this bread and this fish and divided it up and fed thousands of people off of a few loaves and a few fishes. We know that you walked on water to get over here and calm the sea. Peter's telling everyone over here in the corner about how he got walking how he got the ability to walk on water and come to you and then he sank and you picked him up put him in the boat we hear all these stories because you know peter was talking about that you'll never guess what i did last night all the storms going on i seen christ walking i jumped out of the boat and walked on water for a little while you know he's telling people that's peter i would be telling people so you hear the things that are going on right there you know that they can hear the commotion about what just happened and the first thing they say is they said, therefore unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see? Can you show us something that proves that you're the Christ? I mean, besides healing the sick, <laughs> besides giving sight to the blind, besides walking on water, and you divided up this fish and bread, besides all that, can you show us a sign that you're of God? Not, not to mention the fact that Daniel prophesied of you and you came at the exact right time. We're not talking about that or the fact that you turned water into wine or the fact that you're explaining the scriptures to men who have studied it their entire lives. But besides all these things, can you show us something that proves that you're the Christ? Can you imagine asking that? And then the next verse, they explain why they said that. Do you remember what Christ said? Let's look at what Christ said just a little bit. You seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. And then we go down to verse 30 and it says, Can you show us a sign? He said, Our fathers did eat manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Where's their focus? Can you show us a sign? I mean, you know, our fathers had manna in the wilderness. What sign do you have? They want some food. They want some more bread. They want some more fish. They want some manna. They want something. They want something to stuff in their mouth to go into their bellies. That's what they're after. They're still focused on a physical thing when Christ is trying to teach them a spiritual reality. Their mind is not right. So we look at that and they say, we say, well, how can they get all that wrong? Well, don't just chastise these people and don't condemn them without reflecting that back on your own life. Because so many times when Christ is teaching us a spiritual lesson, all we do is focus on the physical hardships or the ideas that we want physically from it. Instead of when we get into a bad situation saying, Lord, what are you trying to teach me here? We say, Lord, take away this pressure. Know what I mean? We miss the point. Let's look back at David for just a second. David is running from Saul. So he's sitting over there and he's trying to make Saul feel better and he's trying to comfort him playing his little musical instrument. And Saul, what's he do? Grabs a dart, throws it at David, pins it to the wall. David's running for his life. He gets and he tries to escape and he won't go around Saul. He finally gets up to his son, Jonathan. He said, hey, shoot this arrow. And if it goes past me and you tell the guy to, or it goes out there and you tell the guy to keep running, I'll know that I need to leave. And he does. David's gone. And then Saul starts chasing him. David's running from Saul. He's hiding in caves. He's hiding in rocks. He's hiding in the wilderness. What if David was sitting there praying, Lord, please take this running from the caves and from the rocks and from the wilderness. Take all that away from me. Take all this running from Saul away from me. Take all these things that I'm having to go through away from me. What if God would have done that? David wouldn't have been the gritty man he was. David had to learn in caves and rocks how to be tough as a boot. David had to learn that God was in control by fleeing his enemy. David had to learn respect for the man that God put in charge by sitting there and having Saul at his fingertips where he could have killed him and ended the chase and became king. But he said, how can I lift up my hand against God's anointed? He cut a little piece off of his garment and showed Saul and said, look, I could have killed you. And then he felt bad about it because he cut his garment. He learned lessons. All through his escape, he was being taught. When Moses was running from the chariots of the Egyptians, Pharaoh's army, they got to a point where they're surrounded by the sea. They're in like a little area. They got the sea in front of them and charging chariots on their right, on their left, behind them, coming to kill them. All these people are belly aching at Moses. They're saying, we'd be better off in those brickyards. 
I wish we were back there making bricks. At least we wouldn't die. Did you bring us out here in the wilderness to be killed? And Moses prayed. And he goes up to this Red Sea and a strong wind came and started blowing the Red Sea back. And the next morning they walked across on dry land. Not only did their faith bring them across that water when they got on the dry land on the other side, the, the Pharaoh's army, the Egyptians got out in the middle of it. The sea come back and drowned them all. How do you think Moses' faith soared after that? Like an eagle. Guarantee Moses' faith was at an all-time high point when he seen the water coming down on them chariots. And he said, God will provide a way. But if he hadn't have been put in that tight spot, if he hadn't have been chastised by the children of Israel, if he hadn't had Pharaoh's army coming after him, if he hadn't had all these things taking place, could he have had that faith where he seen the Lord's hand push that strong east wind back? move the waters and lead them across on dry land. See, we get into the same thing. When we're in a physical bind, if we're not careful, we'll start praying, Lord, remove this bind from me. Remove this hardship that I'm facing. Remove this mountain that I'm having to climb. Instead of saying, Lord, what are you teaching me? Because I'm in a bad way. It's easy. It's easy to condemn these folks. It's easy to look at it and say, what were you thinking? Because you're on the outside looking in. But when you're in the middle of a situation, it's a little harder because you want some relief. You want some help. Those people, you got to think. There's one point in time where Christ said, you know, they've been with him three days and they ain't eight. They wanted to hear the words. They wanted to be around the Lord. But when he fed them, they got a little spoiled. How many of us can say with our own lives and don't raise your hand that at one time you were starving for the word, starving for salvation from the Lord, and you got it. And then you got a little blessed and you got a little spoiled and you kind of forgot the word again. We've all been there in our lives. All right, it says, Our father did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. It says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. He came down to give life to the world. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life to the world. How did he give life? Now I hear a lot of people start explaining this scripture and they talk about the bread of life <coughs> and they talk about the nourishment for the body and different things and I think they're missing the point just a little bit. This bread of life was a little bit different when Christ was talking about it. Of course bread will sustain you. Any bread will sustain you. Barley loaves all broke up with some fish will sustain you, make you really good. But there's more to it than that. It says, And then they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. You know, if they needed the bread of life, it says, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Were those people alive? I mean, they had just ate some fish the day before, right? They had just paddled their little boats across to the other side and got out and was talking to the Lord and watching him. They were listening to what he had to say. They were asking him for more bread. Were they alive? Yeah, physically. Were they alive spiritually? In the day that you eat the fruit thereof, you shall surely die. That's what the Bible tells us. Adam and Eve both ate of that fruit. Sin come into mankind. And man spiritually died. Spiritually was separated from God. The Lord remedied that. He killed an animal. 
took the skin and he covered Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve done had fig leaves sewn together, made aprons. Looked like some loincloths, I'm sure. They tried covering their own sin up. We do the same thing. We justify what we do. We try covering our own sin. We say, we got this. We can, we can make it better because we'll do good deeds to cover up these bad deeds. Good deeds, bad deeds, don't matter. It's all sin. God, I mean, if you got a sin in your life, it says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, which is Jesus, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Adam and Eve tried to make these leaps to cover their sin, and it didn't work. They still hid. They were still ashamed. And God said, did you eat of the fruit? And they said, well, you know, the woman that you gave me, she gave me it. And the woman said, well, the snake, he tricked me. And the Lord came out in Genesis 3.15. He said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Do you know what that means? That's a good study, by the way. A lot of people will read that, Genesis 3.15. I'll just read it word for word right here. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. What is the woman's seed? It's a specific seed. It's talking about Christ. It's a prophecy of Christ. Absolutely. But what about the devil's seed? He's talking to the devil. He said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. That's a fantastic study, if y'all want to look at that just a little bit. Her seed is, is believers, isn't it? Uh, Genesis 3.15? Yeah. It's the prophecy of Christ. That's oh. the first prophecy of Christ in the Scripture. Okay. And it says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. He is the bread of life. He is the bread that come down from heaven. Man, there is a fantastic story about that if you just study a little bit. Have y'all ever heard of an Afikoman bag? Do y'all know what that is? Y'all know what the Passover was? All right, so let's go back just a little bit. We'll go to the Passover. So the Passover, when we're talking about the first Passover, was in Egypt. We just studied about, about Moses trying to truck out of Egypt and Pharaoh's army chasing him. Why did he tell him to go? Well, he told him to go because he lost his firstborn. This is how it happened. They said that you're going to take this little lamb. You're going to take it. You're going to kill it. You're going to catch the blood in a basin. You're going to roast it with fire. You're all going to get inside the house. You're going to eat this lamb. But what you're going to do is you're going to take the blood and you're going to dip hyssop in it. You're going to paint it on the doors and on the top of the doorpost and on the side of the doorpost. You're going to paint your doorpost and you're going to go inside. Do not come outside. You're going to go inside and you're going to eat this lamb. And in the morning, you're going to go. Have your staff on your hand, in your hand. Have your shoes on your feet. Be ready to go because you're fixing to leave out. And the death angel come through there. And as the death angel passed through Egypt, it didn't look in to see if those people had said their prayers or were eating their lamb real good. They didn't look in to see if they had their shoes on their feet or their staff in their hand. It looked in at the house. And it said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And it went through the city, and when there was door on the, or blood on the doorpost, it passed over that household, and the firstborn was spared. But if there was no blood, the firstborn died. And they run them out of Egypt. Jesus is teaching a huge lesson that encompasses all that right here. I'm going to tell you right now, when death comes, it is not looking to see what kind of life you led. You will not be judged on how many prayers you said, how many offerings you gave, how many old women you helped across the street. You're not going to be judged about how much you give to the missionary or if you invited the preacher over for dinner after Sunday. You're not going to be looked at your church role, your bank account, your job, your witnessing times. Nothing like that is going to be counted. What is going to be counted is when he sees the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, then you'll have life. And if that blood's not there, it don't matter what else you did, you will not have eternal life. It's all about the blood. 
And when we look right here and we read this, it says, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. There is a really cool thing that goes on with Passover little Seder services. There's an afikoman bag, and you take this, this bread, and this bread's a special bread. And you break it. All right, it's been roasted. That's kind of cool. You take this unleavened bread, and it's been roasted on grates usually. And if you look at it, I've brought it here before. If you look at it, it's got stripes on it. It's also got holes all in it. And the holes all in it to keep it from rising at all. It's unleavened bread. It's got holes all in it, and it's got stripes all in it. And you take this matzah bread, and you put it inside this afikoman bag. This afikoman bag has three compartments. You put psh, 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 three of them in there. But the center one is different. You take that center one, and you break it. And you put it in there. And you've got one whole piece in one section. In the center section, you got one broken piece. And in the other section, you got another whole piece. And they take this as part of the dinner and they eat it throughout the dinner. But this center piece of bread is taken and it's hidden in a napkin. And they go off and they hide it somewhere in the house and they go through this dinner. And after they eat this dinner, then the kids go out and they search around this house and they find this bread that's been hidden in linen and they bring it back and they open it up and everyone at the table takes a little bite of it they share it between everybody and that's the piece of bread out of the center of the afikoman bag this piece of bread that's been broken I'm the bread of life I've been broken for you the bread that has been striped the bread that has been pierced <clears throat> is really cool. The definition of that afikoman bag is the one who has arrived. That's what that means. And that's part of the Passover dinner. Three compartments. Oh, it's easy to make an analogy out of that. God the Father... God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father spoke to them, led them all through the Old Testament. Jesus Christ came, he was broken, bruised, and pierced, laid in a tomb for three days, wrapped in linen, and then found three days later to be alive. Everyone partakes of him if they want life. Fifty days after Christ rose from the grave. Looks like this would be fifty days from the crucifixion. He had the Holy Spirit come and descend upon Peter and the rest of the apostles. Peter preached and three thousand souls were saved. And Jesus is standing here in front of him and he says I am the bread of life and every Jewish person that participates in that thinks right back and they understand what he's talking about I am the bread of life he that cometh to me shall never hunger he that believeth on me shall never thirst but I say unto you that you also have seen me and believe not all that the Father hath given me shall come unto me, and he that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. This is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all of which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but I should raise it up again at the last day. This is the will of him that hath sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Can you find security of the believer in that? All that the Father hath given unto me will come unto me, and he that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. He is the bread of life, the life that gives you eternal life. I am the bread of life. It was broken, bruised, pierced, hidden in linen, and then found and taken by all men. 
This is what he's talking about. He's bringing right back to the Passover. Do you remember when Christ said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall have no part of me? I'm the bread of life. He's been pointed to. Christ was no accident. He was not born on a certain day out of happenstance. He was not crucified out of accident on a certain day. It just didn't so happen that it was Passover when he was nailed to a cross. This was all set up. It was all put in place by the feasts. That's why I love the feast so much. The sun and the moon and the stars, let these be for signs and for seasons, for days and months and years. Signs and for seasons, beacons and an appointed time, an alarm. And then we move on to Leviticus 23, and it says, These are my feasts. It's the same thing, a divine appointment. They shall be a holy convocation, a dress rehearsal. These are my divine appointments, my dress rehearsal. These are for you. So you'll know what's going on. The Lord tells us if we'll read his word. Everyone says, well, you don't have any idea when the Lord's coming back. You don't know the day or the hour. You know what? You don't know the day or the hour. But you know what you do know? It says, you're a children of the day, not of the night, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You're going to know when it's all coming together. Jesus, you don't work us blindly. When he chose what day his son would die, it wasn't an accident. And on the 15th day of the same month as the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord, seven days must ye eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no several work this in. So what is that? This is the 15th day of the month. What happened on the 14th day? 14th day of the month is the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. It says, these are the feasts of the Lord. These are my feasts. These are holy convocations, dress rehearsals. I've got this all set up. It's on a huge calendar. I've laid it all out and I'm showing it to you. Study them. Learn. Understand. That's what the Lord is telling us here in Leviticus chapter 23. He says, the 14th day, my son will die. 15th day, he's going to be buried. Feast of First fruits were raised from the dead. Pentecost, 50 days later, you're going to count down from that. Or up, oh, actually, the way they done it. A little different. The Holy Spirit came. Then you had the summer. All the spring feasts were fulfilled. Now the fall feasts are coming. What's the first fall feast? Does anyone know? Feast of Trumpets. Everyone say, yeah, that's it. Feast of Trumpets. <laughs> feast of Trumpets. It's awesome. It's a two-day feast. You know what it's called? The feast where no man knows the day or the hour. Ain't that handy? It's the feast where they blow horns. They've got little sections where they blow a horn so many times, then they blow a horn so many times, they blow a horn so many times, and it all adds up to 99, and then they blow the horn one last time, and it's called the last trump. Ain't that handy also? It's the way the Lord works these things out. You're not children of the night, but children of the day. Now, do we know when it's all going to happen? No. But does the Lord give us a good idea? Yeah. He gives us direction. He tells us right here, I am the bread of life. He that cometh unto me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. That's security right there in itself. He said, once you have the Son of God, you have the Son of God. He said, you're not going to be hungering for spiritual oneness with God anymore as far as justification. Now, you can walk out of the will of God and you can lose your communion with God and you can lose your fellowship with God, but you'll never you lose your salvation that was bought paid for by Jesus Christ. And if you're still not convinced that salvation is yours, it says, but I said unto you that you also have seen me and believe not. 
All that the Father hath given me shall come unto me, and he that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. So Christ is not going to cast you out. And let's keep going just down here a little bit. He says, And this is the will of the Father which has sent me, that all which hath given me I should lose nothing, but I should raise it up again at the last day. He's not going to lose you. He's not going to cast you out. He's got you. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. When Jesus Christ died on that cross, which was shown in all these different little bread ceremonies, he purchased forgiveness of sins. The day that you eat the fruit thereof, you shall surely die. And man died spiritually and was separated from God. That was the first Adam. If you remember Paul's teaching, he said, in the second Adam, come and made it all right again. That was Jesus Christ. When he died upon the cross, he paid for sin. Now sin has nothing to do with keeping you out of heaven or putting you in heaven. That was paid for. What does keep you out of heaven is unbelief. Jesus Christ himself in John chapter 3 verse 18. He laid it all out. Let's look. It's just a page or two over. It says, He that believeth on me is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Did he say, because he hath not sinned after he believed on me? No. He said, it's all about faith. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's pretty cut and dry. Let's look at what Paul says about this in Corinthians. It's the gospel. It says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Sins out of the picture. Christ died for him. He paid for him. And then he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then he was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve. And after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then the apostles, and last of all, me also, one born out of due time. The scripture that I had quoted earlier, let's go and just read it. It's Romans 10, 9 and 10. Everyone should know those. But if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Where does it say, and keep the law? It don't. Someone's going to stand up quick and say, well, Paul's the only one that preached salvation by grace. And I guess he is, except for the rest of the Bible. They preach it just as well. Old Testament, same way. When the Lord bore on my eagle's wings, that's grace. When we look through here and we see that Jesus says, All that the Father hath given me shall come unto me, and he that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out, that's grace. The scriptures preach grace all through it. And then you'll have someone else stand up and they'll say, But you can fall from grace, it's in the scripture. Absolutely you can fall from grace. But it has nothing to do with losing your salvation. It has to do with trying to keep the works of the law rather than relying on grace. The law will not get you to heaven. The law will take the absolutely best of men and show him how degraded he is. But grace will take the sorriest cat you know and redeem him and save him for eternity. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. If you take part of him, you'll never hunger. You'll never thirst. Salvation is yours. Fellowship, oh, you got to work on that a little bit. But it don't determine where you're going to spend your eternity. 
am the bread of life. He that cometh unto me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. We get mixed up when it comes to salvation the things of redemption when we start trying to combine physical things and spiritual things. Jesus come up and he tells them, you got your mind too focused on physical things. You're not following me because of all the miracles that I did to prove to you who I was. You're following me because you ate some fish and some bread. Forget about the fish and the bread. Look unto Jesus Christ. He is the one that has eternal life. He is the one that can redeem, that can save, that has bought you with a price. He is the one that was bruised, broken, and pierced and hid in linen for three days. But he rose again. And he rose again for our justification. That's what the Bible tells us. If you believe Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Eternity in heaven will be yours. I am the bread of life. That's what he tells us. Amen.